And I want to introduce today's presenter and willing participant at this time of the day to um, Dr. Christian Berger, who is an associate professor at the Pontifica, is that correct? Um, Catholic University of Chile, where he serves as director of the doctoral program in psychology. His research focuses on the topic of peer relations, specifically how social status and aggressive pro-social behaviors are part of the adolescent peer culture. He is also going to be a keynote at the upcoming anti, the World Anti-Bullying Forum, June 4th through the 6th in Dublin. So there's another opportunity for you to hear more and join us in Ireland coming up. With that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Berger. Thank you for presenting today. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Hi to everyone. Um, thanks for taking some time to, to share with me some ideas and, and research about bullying. Um, today's webinar, I, I want to focus specifically on, on a more psychological part of, of how to deal with bullying, and I want to cover four points, uh, and I, I try to, to put a lot of information, so just if you have any questions, just use the, the, the chat uh, option on your, on your panel. So first, I want to reframe or discuss a little bit on, on, on about what bullying is and how I understand it. Uh, discuss about psychological safety as an asset for for contracting bullying. Then move to specific um, research that I have been doing during the, the past decade on on bullying and and psychological issues that might affect or contract bullying. And finally, let's identify some potential intervention avenues. I know that in the audience we have a lot of uh, people coming from academia, from from uh, educational institutions, schools. So I think it's a, it's a, I would try to cover different aspects on, on how to discuss bullying. So just to start, what what is bullying? And, and over and above the classical definition that, that we all know, this is the, the idea of imbalance of power and, and peer relations, I would say that bullying is an abusive relationship. So the, the whole idea of bullying has to do with abusing others and it has to do with power. So how we deal with social standing, how we deal with social assets and, and who is able to manage them in better ways to some degree. Uh, and the other relevant dimension of bullying is that it's a good phenomenon. Bullying is not a matter of one person bullying other, it has to do with the context, the group, uh, and this sense, it needs an audience. It needs people who are actually uh, viewing it and giving sense to bullying as a phenomenon. And therefore, we need to take care of the social ecology. We cannot understand bullying as just one person because of some specific reasons bullying others. So we need to look at the whole social ecology. And from there, the question is, how do we understand and approach the problem? What is really bullying? And I would like to point the attention to the idea that aggression and prosocial behavior are really adaptive behaviors. These are not, uh, particular aggression is not uh, as dysfunctional, it's actually adaptive. And there's a lot of research showing the adaptive nature of aggressive behavior and actually is promoted in social context. There are several, several studies on group norms, on the social climate and other things that, that shows that aggression is actually promoted in this context. It has to do with how we reinforce and how we make salient sale some specific attributes, um, what are the peer dynamics that are involved in aggressive relationships, how does the school environment actually frame the idea of uh, peer relations and aggression, and what are the main societal goals and, and what are the values that we are promoting and uh, sharing with our kids. In this sense, and we, if we look at the context, I would like to argue that bullying occurs when there are some specific contextual characteristics. One is uh, the idea of fixed social hierarchies. If we have a context in which the, the, the social environment is really, really uh, fixed and stable. It's, it's really probable that we will find some some bullying and some abuse. Uh, same with the idea of having prejudice and discrimination, uh, the way we deal with minority groups, the way we deal with difference. Um, another contextual factor has to do with the goals and the values that we are fostering, and particularly individual goals versus group oriented goals or community, community goals. Uh, a line of research that I have, been, I have been starting to work on is for environmental behavior, and particularly how people who are more pro environmental usually are more tied to group and community goals instead of individual goals. And what we are starting to, to find is that contexts that are more pro environmental have less abuse between uh, individuals, for instance. Uh, then we have the lack of social norms and the encouragement of aggressive or abusive behaviors. Uh, I will move to this later, but when, it's easy to see just our world leaders, how they use aggressive and abusive behaviors to, to relate to each other. And that has to do with how we uh, present the way of 
relating to others, right? And then, of course, there are some certain individual characteristics, and it has to do with social emotional skills, and there are also a lot of research in that, and, and a lot of programs to prevent bullying are fostering empathy, self-regulation, uh, and other social emotional skills, right? So what is really the problem for? What is, what is the, the real problem? It has to do with some specific bad kids, bad people, or abusive people. Is that the problem? And if that's the case, we should do just psychotherapy. Uh, and myself as a, psycho, as a psychologist, I think there's a risk of uh, over psychologization, so to say. So thinking that this is only a psychological problem. And of course it's not. And I would argue that the main issue has to do with the role of the complex. And in particular, your peer relations, relationships with adults, and the social structure in which kids unfold and, and that, that gives sense and meaning to aggressive and abusive behaviors. So I would like to move shortly to discuss the, the role of aggression in these scenarios that I just uh, described before when where bullying might occur, right? Um, three main topics to, to discuss about aggression. The first one has to do with aggression as a way of controlling, um, controlling others, controlling experiences, controlling the context in which we, in which we, we, we develop. Aggression gives a sense of power. It's a sense of disability. There's several, several studies starting early, I'd say 2000, more or less, uh, the work by Tom Sillison, the work by Lara Mayur, showing that aggression is consistently related to popularity, to social status, to disability, to social prominence, to power, right? So behaving aggressively has to do with the idea that I have power to actually control my experiences, my peer relations, my context, my, my, my environment. There's also a lot of research coming from social psychology showing that aggression is a way of affirming identity, both my personal identity and my group identity. For instance, uh, research on contact theory and how groups relate to each other and how we deal with minorities. Um, I will show you later a study on um, mainstream uh, students uh, relating to minority students and how they deal with this idea of identity and how they negotiate their identities. And aggression is, again, a way of affirming it. And finally, uh, aggression gives a sense of control of three, uh, at three different levels, I would say. First, of interpersonal relationships. It is bullying, basically. It's using your power and exerting power against others to control your social scenarios. For instance, who is able to attend a birthday party? Who is able to play with you? Who is able to share some resources? And that's basically controlling your social scenario. Aggression is also used to control emotional experiences. I'm not, if, I'm not sure if there are some psych psychotherapists in the, in the audience, but if you work with teenagers who harm themselves, uh, the, the main report that they give is that they use aggression uh, against themselves in a way to control their emotional experiences. So they can actually control what they are feeling, and that gives them the sense of uh, control anxiety, right, and, and, and fear in general. Uh, so aggression is a way to controlling your emotional experiences. And finally, aggression might be a way to control your way of relating to others in the social a broader context, such as vandalism. So when you see a riot, when you see uh, hooligans working, what, what you see there is the use of aggression uh, as a way of expressing your uh, position against uh, social standards and so social values. Another definition of aggression as a way of uh, to be socially functional has to do with uh, understanding it as a way as a way to relate to others, to to actually frame. Uh, relationships. So you can position yourself to others or to others from different uh, uh, places, right? It could, could come from power and domination, as a bully would do it. Uh, so you accept power, you are not, um, you will not be power to the other person, you will dominate the situation. You will do it from control, and controlling has many different faces, psychological control, emotional control, space, you know, how, you, how you deal with space, and also from leadership. And you could be a leader and an aggressive leader. And this is the, the idea of this uh, common, common uh, discourse in, in educational settings, the idea of a negative leader uh, within, within students. So a negative leader would use his position aggressively to actually control and to get what he wants. Uh, this idea of aggression as a way to relate to, to, relate to others is really very relevant in contexts where hierarchies and social positions are very relevant to establish who you are, who you relate to, who you're friend with, who you're not, who's with you or, or against you. And finally, aggression is a, a way to solve conflicts. Actually, when we develop uh, problem-solving skills, we usually add the, the last name of 
non-violent problem solving skills right? because violence and aggression is actually a way of solving of solving problems uh it's just see politics see business see other other countries in which aggression is used to solve conflict and here we can distinguish interpersonal conflicts such as using power and domination controlling others in a situation adopting specific positions to deal with a conflict and to just have the fantasy of solving it by just exerting power or also interpersonal conflict. So how do you cope with stress? How do you cope with anxiety? How do you cope with frustration? And a lot of literature is showing that behaving aggressively has to do with a way of managing inter interpersonal conflicts, particularly emotion, social emotional conflicts. So how you cope with stress, how you cope with feeling unable to join, how, feeling unable to uh, perform at some levels and aggression might come out in this in this scenario. Okay, so this is aggression, it's not necessarily bullying, but we know that coming from aggression to bullying is quite easy, right? And I would argue that, that if you ask your students or if you ask the population, the vast majority, maybe, I don't know, 95, 98, 99% will be against bullying and will dislike bullying, and they would say they don't like bullying. However, uh, the studies we have been doing, at least in Chile and some in the States and, and Italy, they're showing that bullying is understood as something that is not right. You have to live with it. Bullying is part of the social life. Um, and I think that has to do with aggression as a common social practice. Aggression is all over the place. Aggression is in how you see politics, how you see peer relations, how you see family relationships, how you, how you see uh, people driving on the street. So if aggression is a common social practice, what kids do, what adults can do, is just bring it to the way they can perform it. Right? So moving from aggression to bullying, moving from behaving aggressively to abusing others, it's quite easy, it's, it's straightforward. And I think we shouldn't care that much about bullying, we should care also about the antecedents of bullying, particularly valuing that much aggression as a way of behaving. Because what adolescents are, are hearing for, for us as a society is that this is natural, you have to learn to cope with it. Abuse is part of social relationships, uh, abuse is, is, is common practice. Uh, so you have to learn to deal with it, you have to learn to uh, either be part of it, either detach from it, but you have to, to learn to deal with it. And we give a lot of easy explanations. And that, for instance, bullying happens because there are bad kids. Bullying happens because there are some kids that were raised in specific families with aggressive uh, relational patterns, right? So it's not your fault, it's the bully's fault. You're not responsible, there's nothing you can do about it. You can either become uh, involved in it, you can detach from it, but it's not your problem. And from an ecological perspective uh, uh, approach, Bullying is a problem, it's everyone's problem, right? You cannot be actually just detached from the problem. You have to be, uh, you're part of it, either as an audience, either as a, as a reinforcer, as a defender, but you're part of the problem anyway. So moving to a more deep experience of what are the potential psychological explanations, uh, sorry, implications of uh, being part of uh, bullying relationships or victimization. For victims, what has been reported is that there's a lot of self-blame. Victims uh, blaming themselves. They have something wrong and that's why they are bullied. There's a feeling of abandonment. There's a feeling of uh, loneliness. Uh, and because of that, there's a lot of confidence in others. So basically, they start to detach from others. And usually when we get to know some cases of bullying, it's, it's really late. So victims are already feeling abandoned. They're all, already feeling without no confidence in others. So we need to intervene much earlier than, than that. However, for aggressors, for bullies, there's also a lot of negative consequences, right? Uh, managing the level of a being a bad kid, being a bad person is quite complicated for, for identity. So how you incorporate in your self-definition that you're a bad person, that you are hurting others, it's really complicated to negotiate. Uh, and again, what, what we what we discussed before, I was discussing before, this idea of uh, aggression as a way of controlling experiences, right? Uh, but at the same time, if you use aggression, you're also damaging social bonds. Uh, I will show you later a qualitative study with aggressive kids that shows how you damage your friendships, your peer relations that, by being aggressive. Uh, so they start to being lonely. And uh, there are some other studies showing that aggressive kids basically uh, the only option they have to befriend others is befriending other aggressive kids because they are the only ones who want to be friends or they have no other options to befriend peers. And finally, how, how aggressors may cope with blame. It has to do with the idea of being a bad kid. How do you cope with the idea that you are hurting others, that you are 
about the individual that are making others suffer. And if you don't see other ways to relate to others, if you don't see other other avenues for, for behaving in your social relationships. For bystanders, quite important, bystanders are, in my opinion, the most relevant uh, position to work and to fight against bullying. You have to fight with the, with the audience, not with the actual actors of bullying or, or victims. But what happens to, uh, to bystanders? They are secondary victims and they are secondary aggressors. You could see them as uh, also suffering from a, from a space in which they feel that they, they, they feel fear, they feel the disconnection with others, they feel that they cannot uh, help others, but they also might feel ag aggressive. They they are also being part of the contest, which is making others suffer. Right? There's the fear of becoming a victim. I will particularly focus on this in, in, in the intervention part. Uh, usually bystanders say that they don't get involved in bullying situations because they are, they are afraid that they might also become a victim later. Right? So they don't want to be close to the victim and near the victim. I won't touch on this specifically. And another important issue more in, in the social emotional sphere has to do with how do you deal with these mixed feelings? So when you see a bully making a joke, making fun of other, uh, it might be actually funny. So you might actually have a good time by seeing someone abusing other. Uh, but at the same time, you know that it's hurting, that it's hurting others. So how can you negotiate your feeling uh, a, lot of, a little bit of joy at the same time feeling bad in front of the person. How you how you deal with this? And this is quite complicated in terms of social emotional development and moral development. Finally, for the whole community, uh, when there is aggression and bullying going on, uh, fear becomes the organizer of daily experiences. So kids start to have uh, uh, fear of going to schools. They have fear to go into the bathroom to, or, or to the, or the playground. They don't want to, to be near other 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 peers. So the whole experience becomes an experience uh, uh, defined by fear. There's a feeling of vulnerability, there's a feeling of lack of security uh, in which everyone has to care about themselves but not about the others. So you don't care about your peers, you care about yourself. And that, actually, of course, is uh, weakening social bonds and it's creating a, a sense of distrust. So, and again, it's not about bullying, specific bullying cases, it has to do with how bullying becomes part, of, natural part of day to day life mm -hmm. and aggression. Christian, may I interrupt with a question? Of course. Um, Elizabeth is asking, frequently we think that aggressors' behaviors are due to the fact that the aggressors have low self-esteem. Can you talk about instances when this is not the case? Sure. Well, I, th I think that thinking that aggressors are all the same and, and, and equal is quite complicated. We, we have seen a lot of different uh, patterns of profile of aggressors, right? Uh, the traditional view was to see aggressors as kids who have really low social emotional skills and there's research showing that actually to be a good bully you have to be really socially skilled actually you have to be able to read social scenarios to understand others uh, to connect with others in, in terms of what they are feeling and about self-esteem uh, I would say that that being a being a bully or being an aggressor has to do with feeling insecure not sure about low self-esteem but but uh, not feeling that you are in a position in which you can feel safe. So you might have a high self-esteem, but you might feel vulnerable, but your self-esteem might be weakened. Um, for instance, you might be victimized, you might be embarrassed, you might be uh, put in, in, a, in a strange position. So uh, instead of thinking of aggressors uh, as people having low self-esteem, I would think of aggressors as people who feel vulnerable, right? Uh, so they might become uh, or they might get low self-esteem, but it's not the starting point, I would say. Are there any other questions? I'm not sure if I... Uh, oh, that's it. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let's move to... Uh, I'm, I'm just starting to move to psychological safety, because with, with, that, with all that I said before, I would say that bullying and, and more about the aggression is associated with a sense of insecurity, distress, and social anxiety, and here comes in psychological safety. Right, so as a way to cope with this idea of feeling insecure, being uh, feeling anxious and distrust, distrusting others. So, what is psychology of safety? Uh, and this construct does not come from developmental psychology; uh, it comes from organizational psychology, uh, actually from uh, uh, organizational development. Uh, and it, it, there are some different definitions that I, I, I want to, to to bring here to, to discuss them. The first one is that the degree to which individuals feel comfortable taking positive interpersonal risk. 
so such as trying something new. So imagine a kid, a, a teenager who wants to try something new, who tries to show uh, a specific part of his or her identity, who wants to try some new uh, scenarios or activities. You need to feel comfortable in taking this risk because it's, of course it's, it's a risk of not being good enough, of not performing correctly, of not being accepted. So what do you need to be able to get into this? And this is particular actually, right? The second, being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequences of selling image, status, of, or careers. This is what I, what I was saying before about uh, feeling vulnerable. So you need to be able to, to, to show yourself, to show your identity, to show who, who you think you are and what you want to present to others without the fear of the consequences, right? And, and for this, you need social assets. You need a, a context that, that secures you. Right? And the last one, the feeling that taking into personal risk will not result in embarrassment, ridicule, or shame. And this is quite, quite common in, in, in school settings, right? When you take the personal risk, getting to know new people, uh, getting to or, or, or getting close to the, the, the new students, to the minorities, or, or breaking some boundaries that are fixed between groups, and you feel immediately that you, will, you will be embarrassed, you will be ridiculized, you will be, or you will feel shame. So how can we create the context in which students may feel that they can do this without this fear? being embarrassed. That's psychological safety. And in this sense, psychological safety is not individual. It's not a personal skill. It's not something that you have as a person. It lays in the interface between individual and context. So if you want to develop psychological safety in people, you need to develop a context that will give the experience of psychological safety, right? It's not one kid. It's not the idea of resilience, for instance, in which you work with the person. And here we're working with the context. And the interface with the context and individual. And that's really important for interventions. I, I, I believe that we don't have to intervene in the individual, we have to intervene in the context in terms of giving a space that might allow developing some skills, some relationships, and some some positive relationships with others. Um, Christian, we have two, two more questions, if I may. Sure, of course. Uh, Linda is asking, what about the influence of parents with children who develop bullying behaviors? Uh, there's a study uh, performed in the UK about two years ago, uh, and what they did is they follow kids over 10 years, and they differentiate kids who are, who are bullies victims or bully victims. They did a cross-section analysis and then a prospective analysis of where were these kids 10 years later. And one of the, uh, the, the, the points that they did, they tried to uh, identify diagnosis of those kids, and context, and, and actually, as, as, as the person was saying, was asking, uh, kids who were bullied, I believe it was they were four times more probably to be to come from families in which there's that dysfunctionality and aggression relationships, right? Uh, so, with that said, family, of course, is a really important context for developing uh, ways to relate to others, with validating some some patterns of relationship, but it's not exclusive, right? Uh, for, one, for one side, families will import, but then there's another bunch of studies showing the moderating factor of other relevant relationships and school settings to counteract what kids may, may bring from earlier experiences. And actually, research on uh, attachment theory and early attachment uh, are showing that you may create new attachment figures over time, and particularly entering school, you may create these secondary attachment figures or patterns that may actually counteract your early experiences. So sure, family is really important. I, I start from the point uh, that every parent does the best they can do with the kids, thinking that that's the best for their development. I don't, I, it's hard for me to believe that some parents will do something wrong with their kids and they want to be abusive. What they want their kids to do is to be successful. And the problem has to do with the definition of success. If being successful is being better than others, is being the only person that, that, that gets highlighted, of course, you are promoting a culture of, of abuse, right? And in balance of power. And that's, it's not, it's not the same as saying that these parents are um, promoting bullying. They are promoting a way of defining oneself as successful. Excellent. Thank you. And we have three questions now uh, more. So, uh, Marcia is asking, would you say that self-harm is more due to a feeling of guilt or a feeling of anger? Does it apply more to the victim or the aggressor? Oh, I, 
I really don't know. I'm not a clinician. Uh, I would say that there are different patterns. Uh, but my my take on this would be that self harm has to do with personality traits and it has to do with a more uh, impulsive, uh, non uh, reflective function, right? Functioning. So victims are usually not uh, individuals who are that impulsive. They are actually more quiet. They are more retreat. Uh, uh, so. I wouldn't say that self-harm is not common among victims. That, I mean, that this is something we're discussing about, right? Like cutting oneself or other things. Uh, but for it might be more common for aggressors because of this, this, uh, this trying to find a way to deal with what they're, they're, they're feeling. But I don't have research on this. I don't have uh, academic information on this. So it's just, this is just a guess, right? Uh, yep, that's good. <laughs> Guesses are good. Um, Tara is asking, what role do positive connections in SEL play in reducing bullying? We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. And Great. Whatever. Okay. Good. That's coming up. Um, Rebecca is asking, can you talk about kids who bully others into self-harming behaviors? So that's a little bit of the last question. Can, so can you say that again? Yep. Can you talk about kids who bully others into self-harming behaviors? Okay, that's kind of a, a social pressure um, model, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, that kind of research started to, to grow in the past five years or so. Uh, there was this uh, blue whale game or, or challenge, you know, that there was, yep. that was online. Um, I, I, I really don't have information, really. I don't have research. I, I think that this idea of challenging, challenging others has also the way to do with, with abuse and use of power. So usually people who do this, they don't do the challenge themselves, they make others. Uh, it's like a, it made me think about the, the sororities and fraternities and those rites or, or entering a, a ceremonies that they, they used to, to ask kids to, to, to go through, right? So you have to do something really uh, embarrassing or that, that, that show that you are able to actually go to a lot of shame to be part of this group or to be close to me. Uh, that's relationally aggressive in high high degrees. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with any specific research in this, so I, I really prefer not to give a, a proper answer to that. And, and oh, I don't no, that's fair. That's so fair. <laughs> yep, thank you. And that's it for the questions for right now. We'll let you get back to your presentation. I would just turn on this to the work by Dorothy Espelash that uh, not mm -hmm. herself, but the, the work she's doing with some clinicians, and particularly in LGBT uh, bullying, right? So they, they are working a lot with individual experiences in psychotherapy. And I, I would say that they might have some, some specific information about this uh, in, in Florida. Great. Okay, let me get back to psychological safety. And as, as I was saying before, there's a lot of research showing uh, the effect of bullying or the associations between bullying and what we can see as proxies for psychological safety. So subjective well-being, distress, lower emotional well-being, um, being victimized. For instance, there's a study by, by Magdalena Graham that we published this year in, in child development, shows that the, the most relevant social negative position uh, affecting well-being is victimization. So it's, we compare uh, rejection, victimization, uh, loneliness, and the most relevant factor was victimization. For affecting academic function and well-being, for instance, uh, we know that uh, poor victimization is associated with internalizing problems for for victims, externalizing problems for bullies. We also have some information about the role of context and how the way we uh, create school environments is also affecting psychological safety. And I will get to this uh, in the in, in the research part and the intervention part. So just just to give an idea that psychological safety seems to be really really connected to, to bullying experiences. The question is what, what comes first? Does bullying generate anxiety, fear, and therefore decreases psychological safety? So is psychological safety a consequence of bullying or being a victim? A victim? That would be the traditional medical approach. Or is the lack of psychological safety in this context that drives individuals to search other ways to deal with social anxiety, identity, or peer standing? So in this case, aggression will, be, will enter in the picture. If you feel social anxious, if you feel lack of social safety, you don't know how to deal with these experiences, you might try to use whatever you have in hand, right, to get to control anxiety, uh, this, this, this social stress, and aggression serves this, this, uh, this function, as I showed you before when we were discussing aggression. 
So I would like to point out more in the idea of the lack of psychological safety as a predictor of bullying, more than bullying having the consequences of feeling unsafe. And of course, this might be a, this might be a cycle, right? But I would like to stress this as a way of intervening by creating psychologically safe environments. So how could it work for different bullying roles? How can we uh, understand this for, for uh, different roles in, in bullying situations? For victims, being psychologically safe might uh, enable them to search for help. What's very, very important is a lot of research showing that the main, the main uh, predictor of, of overcoming a negative victimization experience has to do with having good friends, right? And having uh, support. For aggressors, it might, it might predict finding other ways of relating to other and and how to deal with social anxiety and, and social positions uh, stress for based bystanders it might be able to, to, to for them to stand up against abuse so if I feel psychological safe sure I may be able to overcome my fear and just intervene them and say you know what this is not correct this is not appropriate uh, and also they might be enable them to feel good about themselves so actually I can care about others. We had a case here in Chile, a really known case for a, a suicide as, as, as a consequence of bullying, and it was performed by a group of, of students. And one of the things that I, I always thought about this case was, how would these five girls feel about being responsible for the suicide of a peer, right? How do you deal with this feeling but in, in for bystanders? How, I, I'm a peer, I'm a classmate, I, I knew about this, I didn't do anything, and this is the consequences. Can I feel like a good person? Can I feel like morally okay if I didn't do anything about this? And this is the problem from bystanders. So how can we actually give them options to feel good about themselves, to feel that they can actually care about others? And that is for social behavior, right? Altruism, feeling connected to others. For reinforcers, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this basking uh, in the reflective glory phenomenon. So you want to be popular, so you get close to the popular kids. And we know that uh, aggressive uh, uh, kids are actually popular. There's a high correlation between popularity and aggression. So if you want to be actually popular, you might want to be close to those. Uh, and But if you feel psychologically safe, you may find other ways to be uh, part of the social community and the social ecology, right? So you don't need to be close to the popular kids. You might find other ways to, 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 to get a social position and identity. And finally, for all the members of the community, uh, it might enable them to work towards a desired way of being community instead of just trying to avoid bullying. We want to create something, not just fearing the fact that bullying may, may happen. Okay, so with all this said, I want to move now to how we have approached these issues from a, a research uh, point of view, how we have translated this into research questions, and how we, and some, some findings that are supporting the idea of psychological safety as a way to contract bullying. So I have about five or six studies I want to show you. I will, I will check on time, but just different perspective on this. This is a study we performed with Simona Travida at the Universidad de Sacro Cuore in, in Milano, in Italy. Uh, and here we wanted to, to see, we know that there are individual motives that predict bullying. And we work with two different motives. One is anti-psychological, being Machiavellian, which is a personality trait. And the other one was social status, being popular. We know that the both, both predict bullying. We wanted to know, if the classroom norm actually had an effect on this, or is everyone who is Machiavellian will be a bully, or it has to do with some specific context that promotes or counteract the fact that Machiavellian kids may perform aggressively towards others. So we calculate these this, uh, prestige norms, which is not new. It's several studies has work, uh, have worked with this idea of either cool norms, popular norms, and it's basically the classroom average correlation between, in this case, being admired and being aggressive. So we ask, kids within the classroom, who are, who are your peers who are aggressive with different items? And we also ask them, if you could be like someone else, who would you like to be like? So who is your admired peer in this classroom? And if we have a higher correlation, it means that being admired, or you admire people who are also aggressive, right? So the, the, the prestige of a peer has to do with his or her aggressive levels. In this study, we had two assessments over one year, with about 500 early adolescents, and we performed and it's an analysis that's a, a multi-level progression. Uh, I'm not going to get into the method, the analysis, that's not part of the, of the seminar. Uh, I just want to focus on specific, specific uh, outcomes. Uh, we find that actually Machiavellianism predicts bullying, controlling for uh, bullying baseline scores. So kids who are Machiavellian are more likely to perform uh, bullying against their peers, but popularity not. 
popularity was not predictive of bullying. It is predictive of aggression, but not for, not for bullying. It's an important distinction that it has been uh, done by other, by other researchers too. But when, when, when we move to the level two analysis, so what's the classroom effect on this relationship? We found that uh, the prestige norms for relational aggression actually enhances the effect of Machiavellianism on bullying. So if you're a Machiavellian uh, and you enjoy in a classroom in which being relationally aggressive is actually admired by your peers, you're much more likely to bully others. So again, should we work against Machiavellianism as a personality trait, or should we work against uh, the prestige norms of relational aggression in a classroom? And my take on this would be we need to work on the context, how kids are creating a norm, a prestige norm. So what, what are they admiring? What are they valuing? instead of working on the individual who's Machiavellian, or maybe in both, right, and connecting both levels. Another perspective I'll take on this is a study we published a couple of years ago with, with Olga Cuadros, who was a former student of mine, and she was working specifically on uh, friendship quality. Uh, and I'm translating this now in friendship quality as a psychological safety asset, right? So in this study, we wanted to, to understand the role of having good friends, quality friendship, on the effect of victimization on well-being. So we assess victimization, well-being, their friendships, and the quality of their friendship. And we want to know if having a friend is actually a, moder a moderator of the effect of victimization on well-being. So basically, if you're a victim, you have good friends, you may have less negative effects on your well-being uh, compared to if you have uh, non-good friends, right? In this case, we feature a sample of uh, over 600 early lessons, uh, three assessment over one year. So we follow them, uh, and the whole idea is to control from baseline, but also to, to, to see dynamics, pre-relation dynamics. Uh, and this is a social structural modeling analysis. It's a kind of a trying to to uh, confirm an, an hypothesis by the theory. So this is the model. We control well-being at time one. We assess the effect of victimization later on well-being. And then we try to see the, 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 the moderating effect of friendship quality. And we specifically distinguish these four uh, dimensions of friendship quality, affection, disclosure, or intimacy, support, and closeness, right? And we perform analysis separate for boys and girls uh, because we find some uh, invariance uh, effects on, on, on gender. And this is what we see. We actually confirm that victimization uh, leads to negative well-being over time. Uh, but then for boys, specifically having support, peer support, friend support is related to lowering this effect. And for girls, having peer support, but also having intimacy. So being able to disclose personal information uh, in, within the friendship uh, diet is really important for counteracting the negative effect of victimization, right? Uh, the idea of intimacy and disclosure, I would I will get back to this in another study that I will present later. So again, what we need to do is foster positive relationships. And this is the self-framework that someone was asking before. We need to create an environment in which positive relationships uh, nourish, right? And, and, and foster it. If I may ask a question here, Elizabeth is asking, what did you learn about the role of teachers in these studies? I will come to that later on my presentation too. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. But, and then, uh, um, just one more is um, Naeem is asking, in terms of promoting psychological safety, how can young people feel safe to report bullying in school without repercussions from bullies? Okay, that's, that's a very good question. How to create an environment in which you can you can feel secure of pointing yes. out that some people are bullying us without thinking. I, I will show you a study about homophobic bullying that's particular in that, in that topic. So how we foster reporting uh, bullying without being, feeling unsafe. And I will get to that too. So bo both, both will be covered soon. Coming up soon. Okay, great. And one last one is she's asking um, to install or reach a higher level of perceived psychological safety, the level of professionality and co cooperation between the staff must be high enough. A qualitative policy depends on making the school policy predictable and promoting a warm school and class culture. Making Absolutely. this, yep, okay, good. We all agree. And then making this part stronger will encourage children to talk and take responsibility. It puts less pressure on the children and students, I guess. Absolutely, yeah, I completely agree with that, and and that's kind of part of my my final remarks. So I will I will get to that too. 
Excellent. Okay, we're all set. Thank you. That the presentation is leading to the questions I will answer later. So it seems that we are we are on, on, on the same page. Yes, perfect. Okay, so another study that we just it was accepted on, on the Journal of Early Adolescence. That's a, 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 I, 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 for a long time I had the, the question that if you're a victim, who would you like to see as your friend? Who would you would you look after as as relevant peers? So uh, the idea that if you're a victim, you want to feel protected, right? And 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 your friends should be able to protect you. They are the, the main social asset during adolescence. So in this in this uh, study. We ask specifically, who do victims look for uh, as friends and their peers? Who are, who are they looking for? And we have three different questions here. Is there homophily? So do victims actually look for other victims as friends? This is the idea that we share the experience of being victimized, so we come together. That does this really happen or not? The second, the second question is, do victims look for friends who can protect them? And here we have two different takes on this. Uh, they can protect me because they are prosocial, and actually they can protect me because they are aggressive. So since they have power, they might be protective. And that's the kind of the, the jail culture, right? When you are close to the most aggressive ones that they can protect you. And finally, is victimization contagious? And this is a really, really relevant question. So as I asked, as I told you before, most adolescents do not get involved in bullying situations and victimization because they are afraid of being actually victimized later. So this is the idea of, of contagion. If I become a friend of a victimized adolescent uh, peer, Will I be also victimized over time? We ask specifically this question. This are really small studies about 200 kids, and this has to do with the analytical framework. We here working with social network analysis and the RCNA framework, which allows uh, working with really small samples, really in deep analysis. And these are just five classrooms from different uh, schools in Santiago and Chile with pre assessment over time. So we follow peer networks really uh, close over time, and we see how these, friends, these networks are changing and how individuals are changing within these frameworks. So again, I'm not going to, to get into the details in the, in, the, in the analysis. If you want, I can send you then a, a list of references or, or, or studies and you can, you can get deep on this. But I just want to highlight some, some important issues here. So the first uh, square that I have highlighted in blue has to do with the network. Uh, the significant effects uh, show what we were expected. That actually, friendship networks are not dense are less dense than average so what this is saying is that friendship selection is quite selective it's speaky you don't you are not friend of everyone you're really selecting who are your friends friendships are reciprocal so if i nominate you as a friend you will also nominate me as a friend so we create this bond and friendships are transitive so if it's john is a friend of peter peter is a friend of mark mark will also become a friend of john so you close the idea of social groups and social uh, structure, right? So this is what we would expect in a friendship network uh, framework. But then, then we move to the specific question that we have. Do victims actually search for other victims and friends? So do I nominate as friends other peers who are also victimized? And that's not the case. We didn't find a significant effect. So the, the, the level of victimization in the ego or the alter, that's the nominator and the nominee, are not, are not uh, similar. So there's no, there's no effect of being similar in victimizations in order to foster us becoming friends, which goes against the, this idea of we share the victimization uh, experiences. Then we move to uh, who do you look after as friends? And I was really happy to see this effect because what this is saying is that victimized adolescents look after their social peers as friends. So what they specifically nominate as friends, those kids, those peers who are social to others. So the idea of defending is not defending through aggression, it's defending through being prosocial to the context, right? So this is to some degree is encouraging because it's saying that the sociality is actually the way, uh, the evaluated way of coping with victimization and, and, and abuse in this context. And the last question about uh, contagion, we find, and again, I'm really happy to show you this, victimization is not contagious. We found no influence effects. So those kids who become friend of victimized uh, peers over time, they do not become victimized, right? So, and and, and again, if we, if we see the, the early results of being prosocial, it might be that a social kid who might who, who become friend of a, a victim has enough social power and enough social assets or enough psychological safety to just deal with the, 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 the pressure of defending a peer, right? Uh, and again, this this uh, shows that our intervention 
should, should foster for social norms, for social leadership, right? And positive relationships against, against students. This is the other study I was telling you before. This is a qualitative approach, uh, also by, by Olga Cuadros, part of her dissertation. And when, within the same study I presented before, we made a, a in-depth focus in uh, specific participants who were highly aggressive and highly popular. Uh, and the question was, well, how do they deal with peer relations? Actually, can they actually have quality relationships? What's the social experience? Do, do they feel psychologically safe? So in this, we focus on 12 adolescents who were uh, over one standard deviation in aggression and in popularity in both. The, the, the subsample is quite small, and we, we invited them to participate and 12 uh, accepted to participate. In this study, we made in interviews, uh, individual and focus groups, and then we analyzed these two different theories. So it's, it's a different kind of approach, not stats, more to the meaning of aggressive adolescent, uh, aggressive popular adolescents. These are the results. I'm not going to go against all. There's a lot of information here. I just want to point out some specific things I will highlight with the square, the, the red square here. Uh, those adolescents who were uh, aggressive and popular, they report aggression as a self-defense mechanism. So when they felt threatened by the possibility of being hurt or pissed by other peers, they just activated their aggressive behavior, right? Uh, someone was asking before um, about, about this, right? So how, how, how does aggression work in terms of dealing with uh, self-esteem, low self-esteem? In this case, uh, there's kind of a, a warning when you might feel that you are uh, threatened by, by anyone, you just activate your self-defense me self mechanism to disaggression, right? So these kids use aggression as a way to deal with this. And they believe that uh, about victimization, they believe that they can always be victimized by means of being an envied and therefore betrayed by the friends. So what they, they, they report is that I am a popular kid, so since I'm popular, others might want to uh, betray me, be more popular than myself, and just take me down. So I'm always potentially being aggressed or victimized, and therefore I feel really vulnerable, right? If I feel vulnerable, I have to have my self-defense mechanism really activated, which is aggression. So I am popular, I might lose my popularity, I use aggression to stay in this position. Right? So, and of course, this has a really high impact on pre-relation. So this is the second uh, result I want to highlight, which is this idea that I'm always anticipating potential damage with sharing personal information. <clears throat> so if I share personal information, I'm giving power to the other person over me because he might use this information in order to uh, embarrass me or put me in a, in a, in a uh, strange position. So I don't share information. And as you saw before, share intimacy was a really important indicator for preventing the negative effect of victimization on well-being. So if I share information, I have intimate relationships, I have powerful neutral relationships and for these kids specifically they don't have this uh, quality relationships because they are afraid of giving information because they are vulnerable by because of this right so really high impact on potential well-being and psychological safety for these aggressive popular kids who are usually the negative leaders and who are usually we, we, we think that might be the bullies in, in classrooms Okay, and let's move to the last part of, of this uh, research approach, the institutional level. And here I will ask some of the questions that were that were raised just, just uh, before. In this study, we worked with uh, Professor Paul Potit from Boston College and Julie Dantas, who is part of an NGO, kind of the, the GLSEN, the, the South American GLSEN institution who works for LGBT youth. We know that homophobic bullying is really pervasive and normative in schools. There's a lot of report on, on homophobic bullying, particularly in much societies, as the Chilean one is and, and the whole South American hemisphere uh, uh, is. Uh, so homophobic bullying is quite common. It's, it's actually not even seen as a problem still by, by many people. Uh, and if we want to address uh, this topic, we need to promote students reporting. That was one of the questions, right? How, we, how can we encourage kids to report when there is homophobic bullying in the classroom? And we can uh, move this to homophobic bullying, to ethnic bullying, to whatever minority we're dealing with, right? So first we have to recognize and visibilize homophobic bullying uh, as a problem. We have to say this is not acceptable, this is not common, we have to give a clear message of this. Second, we need a whole school community approach to do this. Everyone has to be in line saying the same thing about this is unacceptable. 
uh, and we need to build trust and features and stuff as relevant actors. Again, all the questions and the comments that were raised before, right? Uh, and this very, very relevant in this in the study in the US and then in Chile, the same study where we re replicate, uh, students reported that more than more than 60% of the students reported uh, regularly hearing homophobic comments and remarks from their teachers. Right? So basically, homophobia is quite common. Teachers are just repeating jokes, comments, uh, homophobic comments. So what students are, are reporting is that homophobia is part of the culture, right? And that means it's not a problem, it's not shared with everyone, and they don't trust their teachers. Right? So our question here in the study was, to what extent do school anti-bullying policies, both general and specifically for LGBT uh, bullying, affect the reports of bullying? Uh, we use here uh, a sample of over 1,100 students uh, in four schools. Uh, we focus specifically on those, on those who report having been victimized. At this one, so that's our subsample. We use a question about by listening that we adapted to the Chilean context. And this is a, a, a cross-sectional study. We, don't, we couldn't follow them over time. And we use a uh, path analysis to, to analyze this. So this is the, the, the overall model. I'm just going to focus on, on the significant uh, arrows. Just to give you an idea, the, the blue solid ones are positive effects. The red solid ones are negative significant effects. And dash ones are non-significant, both uh, positive and negative effects, right? So in the path analysis, we'll see specifically which are the paths that, that actually are, uh, achieve significance levels to, to explain the other variables. So our outcome is the report of homophobic uh, or victimization situations, right? Uh, the main predictor for reporting this has to do with trusting teachers and staff when facing homophobic bullying. So I'm, if I'm a student and I will report, and this is very important, we did not focus on, on LGBT participants. This is the reports of everyone in the community. And actually LGBTs are minorities. We are asking here students who were uh, straight, right? And they all say that they will uh, be more prone to report on public bullying if they trust their teachers and stuff and they will do something, right? The, and this trust in the teachers is mainly predicted by uh, interventions that this staff or teachers have made before. So if I have seen my teacher saying, for instance, you know, this joke was homophobic, I don't like this kind of jokes, or this comment was homophobic, or I, I, I feel like oh, this, this news in the newspaper, right, that it's homophobic, and they actually said something about this. They also intervened this. This is a predictor of trusting them and therefore of predicting. By the contrary, in the, in the other part of the, of the diagram, homophobic comments by school staff and teachers, of course, decrease trust in them. If I don't trust them because they are homophobic, I will not report homophobic bullying. And then if we move to the, to, the, to the left, we see the institutional part of the model, in which when students perceive that there was a specific anti-LGBT bullying policy, so that means there is a, a, a actually a, a, a common perspective that, that homophobic bullying is not acceptable, and we will have sanction against people who are homophobic. Uh, in this context, that actually predicts uh, teachers less comments. Right. So if someone was giving a comment, right? We need this whole, whole school approach and teacher working together. Sure. If we have a an institution in which we are clear about the message that we don't accept bullying and we are about diversity and accepting others and respecting others of course teachers even though if they are homophobic they won't be uh, as likely to give these comments right and if they didn't these comments they might create a most a more safe environment or more trustful environment and that would turn into students reporting homophobic bullying and again this would increase or or foster the idea of uh, shared idea against homophobic bullying, right? Final study I, would, I want to show you over almost on time has to do with diversity. This is a study that we perform with minority, um, ethnic minority group. And just to give you an idea, in Chile, 95 of the population is white European and only 9% is indigenous. And within this 5% the Mapuche is the most uh, significant population. And here we want to know if the context provides conditions for facilitating inter ethnic positive experiences. And we compare the effect on uh, minorities and majorities. So just one diagram, the uh, mm -hmm. black line is the non-indigenous, uh, the majority group, and then which is the minority group. We assess comfort in inter ethnic relationships. So do you feel safe, happy, okay with relating to the other group? And we compare the two situations, uh, classrooms with a higher peer norms towards diversity and contact in a classroom with low peer norms to diversity, so high meaning 
I really want to know other people, different people who really get to know together, we are friends together, et cetera, right? And interestingly, for both groups, the effect is positive. So in high peer norm classrooms, uh, they feel much uh, comfort in interpersonal relationships, but the effect is much higher for the non-indigenous, for the majority group, right? And we explain this by thinking that uh, for minority uh, kids, being a minority is quite uh, present in their day-to-day -day experiences. But for non-indigenous or non-minority, they just don't see the other group. They are part of the majority, they don't care about diversity. Until the peer norm is saying, that, you know what, we are diverse, look at this. You need to be careful with this. You need to see and experience diversity. So the effect is much higher on this. I will skip this. So let's get to the final remarks on this. What can we learn from this? How can we turn this research into practice? Uh, I would say that we need to overcome the idea of just attacking the problem. So we, it's not the case that we just don't want bullying to happen. We just don't want to take it out from the picture. We want to promote something. And here comes in social emotional learning, cell programs. There's a lot of studies on this if you want to look at this. There are some meta-analysis by Dorlak, by Taylor, that you can, you can see the effects on this. This is, these are not tackling on bullying, these are tackling on nurturing environments, right? Promoting positive relations, good climate, and the idea of citizenship, citizenship more broadly for environmental behavior. And I will move to this specifically. There's a lot of, of, of uh, evidence showing the effect of uh, cell programs, STP prevention programs, positive discipline programs. But how do we explain this? What, is the, what are the processes, what are the processes that makes these programs affect actual um, lowering levels of, of bullying and promoting well-being. And I would think that peer relations, student-teacher relationships, school climate, and our overall culture of care concern are the, the key factors for this. I would just one slide for each one of this. Uh, in terms of peer relations, we need to foster quality friendships, as I saw you, showed you before. Intimacy and support seems to be key, so we need to create spaces for this and positive peer norms. So peer norms that are inclusive, that are diverse, are caring, are prosocial. How can we do this? Uh, I think we need to open instances for contact, for shared interests, for dyadic, intimate, and wider group relations. And specifically, I want to talk on after-school activities. We had a study just, just finished last year, and we assess the same kids that we assess within school contexts. We assess them within after-school activities. And we ask the same question, who are the aggressive peers in your group? In classrooms, we also get, we usually get 20% of nomination of aggressive peers. In the after-school activities, we get non-nomination, nothing. So aggression is not part of after-school activities. And the kids are the same. So aggression is not in them. Aggression is in the relationship they create in this context, right? So again, if we, if we learn from what is happening in after-school activities and programs, we might bring this to schools. And I will turn your attention to the work by Nancy Deutsch and University of Virginia. Uh, they, they have this uh, Youth Next program, which is quite interesting and in, in the which they have been doing on this. Regarding student-teacher relationships, uh, I talked a little bit already about secondary attachment. Uh, teachers are really relevant and significant others uh, and caregivers for, for students in, in different stages of their development. They may contain, they give social emotional support, but they also organize the social environment. So teachers are actually the ones who are creating the norms and the structure in the classroom. They model behaviors, as I just told you about homophobic bullying, and they also act as the liaison between school and family. So they are the, 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 the key actors in creating this whole school, whole community approach and message that bullying is not acceptable, right? How do we do this? I would say teachers training, both uh, uh, in practice and early training, practice communities, let's bring in teachers together to discuss about how they do this, how, how it works, what not, uh, and how to, 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 to create new avenues mentoring processes, teamwork, so the same thing that the one participant was saying before. About school climate, that's one of the final ones. We need to have clear, explicit, and known regulations uh, regarding bullying, discrimination, and abuse. It has to be a really clear message, a really clear and overall message about abuse is not acceptable. Aggression is different, abuse is not acceptable, right? Uh, there's a lot of studies showing, and there's a meta analysis by Toffee and Farrington in 2011, showing that intensive programs, including playground supervision, parental meetings, are more effective, so whole school approach. Uh, there's also studies by Gerlinger showing that schools who manage their discipline by positive uh, discipline uh, approaches and affirmative management compared to those who are authoritarian are have much uh, lower levels of bullying in the classrooms. 
And school belonging, we know that school belonging decreases school infantry later and also prevents internalizing systems as symptoms. So we need to foster school belonging. We need to we need to make kids feel safe and part of where they are living, that they can trust and relate to others. And this is post group interventions, participation, and meaningful, meaningful school management. So let me come to the, my last slide. What's the take home message? This kid that I showed you before is not necessarily a bad child. He unfolds within peer groups with specific norms, with significant adults who are mentioned attitudes and behaviors. So it's learning what is about in the context. He follows institutional definitions about what's sanctioned, what's not sanctioned, what's visibilized as a problem, what is problematized. And aggression and bullying might therefore be seen as functional and useful social resources for achieving the goals that he has within this context. So in my view, uh, the lack of psychological safety might be not a consequence, but a needed uh, starting scenario for the emergence of alternative ways of relating to others. We need to make people feel, make students feel psychologically safe by means of promoting positive relationships with peers, with teachers, with parents, and the whole community, so we can actually lower the possibility of pulling to appear. Just being known exactly, that's my presentation. Thanks to you for your attention. And as Lynn said before, I will be in Dublin at the World Anti-Bullying Forum. So I hope to see you all there or in any other conference or conference that we can share uh, thoughts about winning again. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much. That was a lot of information you packed into our hour and we appreciate it. I'll send so, out information to all of um, the participants about the World Anti-Bullying Forum. Mark your calendars for June 4th through the 6th. We would love to have you all there and continue this conversation. Thanks again, Dr. Berger, and have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.